Hey all everybody, Haku here with my first read through for uh, Magical Girl Raising Project or Mao Shoujo Weeks at Keikaku Jokers. Uh, so we had Jokers Chapter 1 Part 1. Uh, sorry I'm a few days behind, been sick this week, and of course that's really thrown me off with like everything. Um, but I'm not going to be taking the week off. This is going to count as this previous Tuesday's video. So you're only going to have to wait like three days until next Tuesday uh, to get Part 2 of this chapter. Uh, now the chapters for Jokers, there's only six of them, but when it comes to length, they're like, um, they're like, some of them I think are like over twice as long as the chapters for, um, limited, so I'm probably gonna have to split them into four parts each. I was kind of hoping to split them into like three parts each, um, but we'll see how things go. Depending on how the battery goes for this video and how my voice goes, uh, there's a page break at the end of page 15 and one at the end of page 21 after that. Uh, I kind of wanted to get to the end of page 21, but if once I'm at the end of 15, maybe my voice is failing or maybe the battery's not looking so hot, then I'll go ahead, end that here, post this one, and then continue on from there uh, for part two. So, uh, yeah, it all depends. We'll see how all that goes. Uh, now, hopefully... I'm hoping there will be no problems whatsoever with my audio, so uh, yeah, that's just something I've been worried about, but we'll see how it goes. Let's uh, get into chapter one, I'm interested. Also, if you haven't seen, in the hot q and I did a 30 minute long discussion talking about both limited and uh, some, like my prediction for the powers based on the girls' character designs. Uh, for Jokers, and also I had my video where I react to and discuss the uh, Jokers character designs. So there's a lot of Magical Girl Raising Project stuff that I have posted uh, since I stopped reading Limited if you want to see either of that. Um, yeah, anything else? Also for the Favorite Characters Update video, with Limited, the ending made it seem like a lot of the characters really didn't mean anything, so it's hard for me to really like judge them and like I don't know, compare them or anything, so I'm not sure how I feel about any of that yet. So I'm just going to wait and I guess do an updated favorite characters video after this arc. Just jump straight into this one. So sorry, it's the beginnings, so it's a little bit of a long-ish intro, but let's get into actually reading. Uh, so we're starting with uh, chapter one, Beyond the Prism, and we're starting with Magical Girls Wanted at the top. Do you know what a magical girl is? It's receiving the best magical powers and amazing physical abilities from God. It's about becoming uh, mysterious and adorable girls who solve problems ranging from city disputes to dangers from space. These girls were originally normal humans, though there are some exceptions. But by chanting a secret incantation imposing, they can become heroes of justice, everyone's idol, the strongest heroine, and transform into magical girls. Until now, the world of dreams and magic was shut off by a heavy and hard door. In order to become magical girls, you'd need talent that only 1 in 10,000 people had, and a little bit of luck. If you didn't have all these things, then you can't transform into a magical girl. How very sad and depressing. But don't worry, technology has been rapidly progressing. Using new technology, we've led magical girls themselves into the next stage. Regardless if you have potential or not, with motivation, courage, and love, Anyone can be a magical girl. You won't give up being a magical girl for reasons like if you don't have potential then you can't be a magical girl. It's impossible for someone my, or my age or I didn't meet someone related to it, will you? We support people like these. In order for people to become magical girls we've cooperated to give you an after sale service. Whether it's one, or whether it's one to ten, leave it to us. Our support system is open 24 hours a day. Furthermore, all our services are completely free. We don't even charge halfway, so don't you worry. Open the door to a magical world. Just have a bit of courage. And now from that, we're getting into the prologue. Okay, just checking everything. So now with the prologue, we have the Hitokuji or the Hitokoji Manor was raided a little while or er, raided a little while during 1 a.m. The youngest daughter, Kanoe, had ordered them to build the mansion separate. In the corner of the vast site that was her family's neighborhood, she had enough financial strength to build a mansion with just a thought, and even had enough land to build another house inside the grounds. And this youngest daughter also had a hobby of doing whatever she wanted. Also, there was no one who could, around who could stop her. 
Mamori Totoyama was, er, while standing beside Kanoe, wrapped with bitter thoughts watched as the mansion was built. Cutting who knows how many cherry trees deep into the mountains made it seem like a rich person destroying nature. Using polished black and white marble, the floor was drawn with a checkerboard pattern in a luxurious way, and Mamori felt revolt as she thought, you should use your money better. What kind of use would she make, er, would she make, er, what kind of use would make for a better way to use it. She didn't have any concrete opinions on that, but seeing the Hito Kojis, seeing Kanoe splurge like this, just seeing it made her feel horrible. Kanoe remarks that the workers' jealousy of capitalists don't seem like they're going to change were also annoying. Every day, craftsmen would come in, and people other than craftsmen would come in as well. A self-proclaimed Japanese-speaking German, but no matter how you look at him, he was from an Asian furniture store, an art dealer with a black suit who covered his right eye with an eye patch, an armored vehicle eye patches, an armored vehicle running around the grounds like he owned the place. Lots of people like that came in, and after about a year of construction, the residence was completed. It looked comfy because she compared it with her house, but if you look at it on its own, she would think it was a mansion for royal aristocrats who exhausted their luxuries to build. But still, Kanawe wasn't satisfied. She ordered Mamori to modify the defense equipment. Mamori Totoyama can transform into the magical girl Shadow Gale, a black nurse that has a giant wrench and scissors was her style, and Magical Gale's skill was the ability to remodel any machinery. That power had been repeatedly used in accordance to Kanoe. She's messed with her er, messed with speakers that were twice her height, she's modified some mysterious goggles too. She's changed objects that she knew how to use in their original state to unknown objects that she had no idea how to operate as well. When she, ex when she exercised her magical skill, she didn't necessarily have to know how to operate the target. She sometimes wondered if it was good enough to modify it to this extent. And although she didn't know how it would be used, at the very least, it won't be used for anything bad. Speaking of good and evil, Kanoe was a villain. She judged herself above laws and societal norms. Mamori had been carrying that kind of partner. From a young age to when they graduated thir er, when they graduated third grade high school, until now, that relationship hasn't changed. At first glance, Kanoe looked lovely, and after she transforms into the magical girl Fleff from her wheelchair prop, she had the image of a sickly person, a prisoner of war, and a woman with depth. And all she needed to do to her victims that didn't know her real personality was have a little smile in order to make them understand. So they graduated high school then, so this means Kanoe and Mamori, it's been like, what, a year or two since uh, Restart, maybe? Because weren't they still in high school during Restart? Um, or I thought they were still like in middle school or something, but I guess maybe they were in high school. Um, oh yeah, because Nene Ono was a middle schooler, so I guess they were high schoolers. Um, Kind of look lovely after she transformed magical profile. Okay, I already read all that. Okay. Personality was to have a little smile to make them misunderstand. Mamori knew to what extent she disliked Kanoe's human nature. She'd been hurt many times. But she couldn't defy her. If she left the house, a follower would come along soon. She's known this from past experience. And so, while the inside of her heart was saying, I hate this, I hate this, Mamori responded to Kanoe's orders and worked accordingly. While she wondered if this was for crime prevention, sometimes she grumbled out loud. After she finished her work, even if I did all this, I'd ne it'd never be useful anyways, she sighed out. Half a year since then, the manor was attacked. Okay, so it's been even longer. Um, let me get something to drink while it's at this page break, or scene break rather, so that I don't completely... Uh, destroy my voice because we have still got lots to read so uh, yeah let's go um, when she was actually in a position where she was under attack for the first time she understood the value of the of these defenses she was trembling in the safety of the underground room and she could only do that because she was protected by the shelter the shelter made by Shadow Gale or the shelter made by Shadow Gale, whose inside wouldn't be va vaporized even if an antimatter bomb landed to direct it, became a solid castle against magical girls that attacked us a bunch.
that attacked as a bunch, okay. Why would you need this much protection? Are you preparing for a nuclear war or something? Scoffed Memori as she chuckled. But when the time came when it became useful, she clasped her palms and was thankful. She held her hand deep in her heart, breathing out loud as she sat deeply in her chair. The white ceiling on the linoleum floor, the simple room with the light gray wallpaper, the bedding and table, the monitors used for observing the upper rooms, there was nothing but the minimum required facilities. When she looked at Conaway sitting at the seat next to her, she was the magic she was the magical girl Fle was looking at monitors. Shadow Gale was also attracted by the monitors as she looked at them er, as well. The main building was quiet. There were no signs any thugs have invaded. In the manor there were thugs with full faced helmets holding nail bats in their hands. They looked like they were searching for something as they wandered around while peeking off the carpet and tearing off the wall clock. She had a chill as she wondered what would have happened if they escaped too late, and her spine froze as she wondered what would have happened if the main building was attacked. Usually, in the everyday space where they lived, there were some non-everyday things that were crawling, crawling about. She remembered discomfort and disgust. She turned her eyes away and tried to talk to the magical girl next to her, but seeing Fle's expression seemingly enjoying this made her want to hit her <laughs> instead. Those people. Do you know them, my lady? I don't. Then why do you look like you're enjoying yourself? Fles smiled without responding. Shadowgale looked at the monitors once again. The armed invaders were looking for something. She didn't know anything more than that. Since Fle always talked about things she didn't understand, it was better not to understand them one by one. Uh, for now, she was thinking about how to solve the current situation. Those people. They aren't magical girls, are they? That's right. If they're normal people, then it'll be okay once a security company comes, right? But the security company won't come, you see. Excuse me? A true security system would silence everything. There's no way to contact the security company. Huh, but they aren't magical rules, right? They're just ordinary people, right? Look at them. Her long white fingers pointed at the monitor. Their movements are strange. Among the thugs, they were following the movements of one person gazing steadily, wobbling their feet, their heads covered with a full-faced helmet, shaking heavily. They were dragging themselves along the checkered floor. Each one of their movements were sluggish. She couldn't see any anger that would usually drive people to act violent, nor could she see the impatience of wanting to get the job done before police or security came. It was really strange. These dazed-looking people, er, these dazed-looking people can't follow orders like shut down security and push forward the way professionals do. Someone has to be pulling the strings here. They're probably being controlled by magic. Magic. Magical girl. The danger was far higher than simple armed humans. Inside her mind was... Or inside her mind, who was only worried for her own safety, the faces of her family and friends now appeared. The main building's okay, right? I contacted them and told them to shut the doors no matter what happens. The defenses over there are also prominent. I purchased an anti-magical girl system and had you modify it, remember? If they shut, or if they just shut themselves in, there's nothing to worry about. Conaway was a capricious, devilish person who liked to spit out lies, and to Mamori was the actual devil itself. But, er, but one point she had was that she cherished her family and never wavered on that. If she thinks it'll be fine, then there was no need to worry. Mamori breathed a sigh of relief and once more looked at the monitor. The thugs that Fle told her were being manipulated by someone repeatedly turned over and peeled off things without getting the least bit bored. What are they even trying to do? Looking for us, it seems. Until when, though? Until they find us. Thanks to Fle replying back with an enjoyed-sounding feeling, Mamori gradually became angry. Not just Fle, but the controlled thugs and the puppeteer behind them made it feel like she was being messed with. At this rate, they'd never find any evidence. However, Fla and Shadowgale, even as magical girls, weren't confident in their physical strength. They'd have no difficulty against the brutes they saw on camera, but since the one controlling them is invisible, they wouldn't know how to avoid her if they suddenly came out. It'd be better to find things that would reduce their anxiety and danger, something that wouldn't needlessly endanger her friends, a plan to seize the invaders without worry. While having the image of the riot police suppressing these thugs, Shadowgale talked to Fla. 
Milady, you bragged that you'd become an important person in the land of magic, right? Well, I didn't brag. I only told you the truth. Don't you have a direct hotline to them or something? Flat paused for a second. I do. Then let's use it. Let's ask them for help. Tell them we're under attack by magical girls and they'll dispatch some police magical girls. Wouldn't that be good? Or have they been silenced as well? Flesk squinted her eyes, looking away from the monitors, looking downwards, then upwards, and stood up from her chair. As a result of pursuing human engineering, the cyberpunk-like design chair lowered behind her when Fle's thighs pushed on them. While looking at the ceiling, Fle began to speak. Sorry about that abrupt jump cut, but uh, continuing right where we left off midway of page 7, uh, because I took this cut, I charged the camera while, it, while I was gone, so I'm definitely going to make it to page uh, 21, the end of that. So either way, continuing on, we left right when... Mamori was saying so, it was Mamori. So, don't you think that it's strange? Uh, what part of it is strange? The ones that sent these people here are no doubt part of the land of magic, because whoever that was should know exactly what kind of person I am. Which means, if they weren't such great fools, they should, er, they should have already thought about the hotline. The invaders deliberately went to all the trouble so that we wouldn't notify our security company. Isn't it interesting how they completely ignored the, lo er, the line directed to the Land of Magic? Which one is scarier? You shouldn't even have to think about it. Now that she mentioned it, they didn't want to be discovered. Uh, they didn't want to be discovered by the security company, yet they don't care if they're discovered by the Land of Magic. Is that what she's saying? Rather than thinking that the soldiers would find no problem in contacting the Land of Magic, perhaps they want us to contact the Land of Magic. They've been using half measures until now, and I can't see and er, and I can't see any will of them wanting to succeed at their raid. They hide themselves and use ordinary people who seem like they could fail at any time. Their motives are transparent. Why do they want us to contact the land of magic? If I was attacked, they'd have to find the perpetrator. No matter how insignificant the item or the item is, they won't miss it because it might contain clues to the perpetrator. That's what they really want. And they'll send an investigation team all the way here, too. Well, that's true. Until we find the culprit, we can't really sleep safely at night. If it's just a house investigation, sure. But if they get no clues, then they might just interrogate us. And what's wrong with that? The examination division has a variety of people with a variety of magical skills. Even if I don't leave any evidence of what I've done, they'll peek all the way inside my head. It'll be difficult to escape. Shadow Gail grabbed onto the chair's armrests and stood up halfway. The sound of the chair's movements echoed with a strange loud noise in the room. Fle, who was looking at the ceiling, turned to Shadow Gale. Her face was in a fun expression as usual. There's no need to give them a reason for a different investigation. Do you understand? So, I kind of like this, where she's like, well, we can't call for help. Because if we call for help, they'll do an investigation. And if they do an investigation to find out who's after us, they'll also find out that uh, that I'm, I'm kind of sketchy. So I, I actually really love that. Uh, just checking this audio really quick. Yeah, it still looks okay. I had some um, audio issues with the video I recorded before this, so it's got me a little bit paranoid at the moment. Um, but where are, where are we? Um... Thanks to a horrible feeling of dizziness, she couldn't stand up. She sat back onto her chair when she had been half standing up, sighing as she placed her hand on her forehead. Flesh should have been in a high position. Ever since they built the house, they've only been visited frequently by suspicious-looking magic-related people, and she sees that their attitudes are always like someone toward someone else in a higher position. Having Fle investigated for another case, they have no proof, but... It can't just be that simple. The Land of Magic should have been the kind of thing that lets people go about their own pace. Just what happened to make her in this situation? Mamori, you're thinking of something rude just now, aren't you? Nothing rude. Just, how did it come to this? I can't bear it if you're disappointed or show disdain in me, or, or show disdain to me because of a misunderstanding. Mamori, so let's correct this. I'm not being pursued by the Land of Magic. If the Land of Magic seriously wanted to pursue me, they wouldn't be this indirect. Well, I guess, but... There, er, these are only people who don't think very much about me here. Naturally, I have someone I can rely on as a shield behind my back. If we can pull through past this emergency, then we'll be able to get on a lifeboat on our own. You don't have to worry about anything. Then, what do we do? 
Call Lapis Lazuline. Make the counterintelligence level set or make the counterintelligence level set to emergencies when contacting her. With the counterintelligence system you made with your hard work, Mamori, not even the Land of Magic can detect it. So we don't have to worry. At any rate, not even the original person who made it can understand its principles or codes, right? Lazuline. When she heard that name, Shadow Gale's chest felt pained. Of course, who Fla talking about wasn't the second Lapis Lazuline, the magical girl they once fought together with. She's no longer in this world anymore. You can't leak out the fact that you contacted her. Have Lazuline visit directly using the gate. But why have Lazuline come here? We'll have her take my memories clean. The person Fla was talking about was the third Lapis Lazuline. The magical girl Lapis Lazuline can use her magical skill to store the memories of others in blue spheres. Memories of objects, memories of people. Memories of things, or memories of things I might have seen that could cause trouble. I'll have her clean it away. Then, there won't be a problem even if an investigation is conducted. For the time being, the subject of the investigation will just be monitoring. But, we will literally not know anything. I see. I guess that's a good thing. Again, this is a really cool little storyline. Fla er, Fla planning something bad would have made her frustrated, but rather it was the better thing to do. While the investigation would be in vain, you could say that Fla is not doing anything wrong. In both senses, it's a good thing. Shadow Gale nodded two to three times. The edge of Fla's lip slightly curled. You're still thinking of rude things, aren't you, Mamori? Please stop trying to read people's minds. I'm not just having La er, Lazuline wipe, w er, wipe my memories clean. I'm going to select an appropriate person and give the necessary information of my memories to them, on the condition that this person seems like they have nothing to do with me. Huh? I thought you wanted to, er, you wanted her to take it because they're memories that can cause trouble if they're seen. Isn't it pointless if you do that? After Lazuline does her job, Flood didn't listen to Shadow Girl's answer and grinned. We should contact the Land of Magic. Alright, and that's the end of the prologue, and now we're going to be getting into the actual story. Let me, uh, get a sip of drink really quick, so I don't lose my voice. Because I would like to, uh, record another read-through after I finish recording this, or at least attempt to. At least make an attempt. Uh, so yeah, now we're starting at page 12. Uh, let me just make sure this audio still looks alright. Yeah, like I said, just so paranoid about it messing up. Because especially for something like a read-through or a live reaction, I really, really don't want to lose it. You know? Um, so we're starting at Chapter 1, Beyond the Prism, with Prism Cherry, who I'm assuming is the one I was calling Diamond. Okay, so starting with Prism Cherry. Sakura Kagami was an average girl no matter where she went. She wasn't faster than others, but no one would point out that she's slower either. She didn't have a singing voice that would make people hear with ecstasy, but she didn't have horrible pitch either. She didn't have to be taught anything, but she wasn't leading anyone in study either. She wasn't extraordinarily cute, but she wasn't so ugly that you didn't want to look at her. She was never the center of conversations, but she wasn't an outsider to anyone either. Everyone always thinks of themselves as the hero of their story. It's because they're the protagonist that they think they should have the quality suitable for a protagonist. That was human nature. Every elementary school student has some kind of expectation for themselves. Sakura didn't think she was average until her friend pointed out, Sakura, she's kind of always in the middle, you know? If she made an effort, she can be better than she is today. Making effort was a little annoying, so she was a bit lazy on that, but to her, she was an I-can-do-it-if-I-try girl. That's what she thought. Swimming school, abacus class, calligraphy class, she even took those lessons. She didn't show any special talents. She was average even in basketball and volleyball. She didn't get any awards in arts and crafts, and because of a cold, she didn't get any full-time participation awards. Since she had two cavities, she didn't get any good teeth certificates. She's tried many things. She knew that she had no special qualities, and when she withdrew from something, she'd repeat it once again. She didn't make any special efforts, but she didn't drop out either, and while she continued to grow while being average, she became a middle schooler. There, a chance finally came around. Intelligence, reflexes, they're not standards, they can be easy to count in numbers. Um, in numbers, to Sakura it was something to be measured with unknown measures. A magical girl test. 
She was handed an invitation with directions written on ink that was visible only to people with magical potential in front of the school. She was taken by her curiosity, wondering what exactly is going on. In the public hall in the middle of the night, Sakura Kagami became the magical girl, Pris Prism Cherry. I also like Kagami, of course, as Mirror, I believe, and Sakura refers to the cherry blossom color of her hair. So again, I think my guess about her having some kind of mirror-related powers might be true, and she has Prism in the name. So between Prism in the name and her name being Kagami, Mirror, um, it's a good guess. Either way. Okay. Large cherry decorations were placed all over her body. She had a sparkling fancy costume that reflected light, transparent like white shining boots, uh, cute cherry-like hair ornaments, not to mention her face was shaped like Sakura transformed into a different person. Looking at Sakura at Prism Cherry now, there was no way people would call her neither cute nor ugly. People should turn their heads around and see an extraordinarily cute girl. And during the magical girl test that was conducted, since she was the only person participating, Sakura automatically became a magical girl. From here on out, she'd open the curtains to an anime and manga-like her er, pleasant, fun, thrilling, and beautiful daily life. Those expectations inflated in Sakura's chest. But those days never came. Prism Cherry was an average magical girl no matter where she went. Her arms were strong, her feet were fast, and her physical abilities were excellent compared to humans, but among magical girls, she wasn't extraordinarily strong, but she wasn't extremely weak either. She once asked the officer responsible for her about somewhere where combat-oriented magical girls gathered to polish their skills and visited it. But if she mixed herself in with them, she was convinced she'd be mincemeat in her weight class. She had thrown away her dreams of becoming an extremely strong magical girl. Her beautiful appearance and gorgeous costume were all buried among the magical girl population. It was impossible for a single flower to assert itself, or to assert itself in a field of flowers that stretched the horizon. Her magical skill was the same. Compared to other magical girls, it was neither convenient nor special. She had the ability of freely changing what's displayed in mirrors, mirror-related. It was that actually like only very useful in very specific circumstances. It was very plain. There was no flourish. Just for fun, she tried changing garbage in a mirror to, to a gold block, but the garbage in real life didn't change and continued being there. She changed around the images and mirrors as much as she liked to have fun, and she's been a magical girl for around two months. And from there she got bored, and didn't even use her powers anymore. It's not that Sakura got bored of it, she just had no interest in her powers. That's what she thought. While she was a magical girl, she wasn't a chosen hero, helping people in the city by solving their small problems. That's what a magical girl's there for. No demons ever came, her mother never told her, Sakura, I see you've become a magical girl too. The only one that can inherit the second generation is you. That's what I was thinking. No prince came from the land of magic, Prism Cherry kept living her magical girl life indifferently, and while she was picking up garbage, erasing graffiti, carrying abandoned bicycles, and comforting crying children, she noticed that she became a second year middle schooler. I actually really love this backstory, how she was just normal, she was like, oh yes, I'm a magical girl now, it's going to be totally different, and then her dreams came true and she realized that her dreams weren't really that great or special. It's actually a really, really cool uh, backstory. So, continuing on. As a second grade middle schooler, people began to think about their futures. Having salaries paid by the Land of Magic for doing magical girl activities were limited only to the so-called working elite magical girls. Prism's cherry off er, Prism Cherry's officer looked out into the distance and muttered, and muttered out, kind of unfair, isn't it? Sakura, Ka er, Sakura Kagami wanted to be somebody. That was her vague image of a successful person. A professional sports player, a successful manga artist, a great detective, a brilliant lawyer, a surgeon with the hands of God, a musician with fans around the world, a magical girl chosen to save the world. So, I kind of like this. I don't know if we've seen a professional sports artist, but... Um, but wasn't, uh, what's her face, um, wasn't Jenna Psycho a manga artist, and then Detic was a great detective, um, Ruler, Ruler, I guess Ruler wasn't a lawyer, she was some sort of businesswoman, but I guess we don't know that she was a lawyer. Surgeon with the Hands of God, I don't think we know anybody like that yet, Musician was Top Pop, 
and uh, chosen to save the world is whoever Pithy thinks is chosen to save the world. Um, either way. They won fa <clears throat> sorry. They won fame and fortune. They leave their names. I can be a protagonist too, she thought to herself once in a while. But reality was different. Even when she became a magical girl, the chosen ones were all somewhere else. Most magical girls kept their magical girl activities within range of their hobbies, managing to eke out a living by working as someone else. People who lived on welfare, criminals who exploited their magical girl powers for evil, people who lived like fairies and hermits in the forest with the animals. There were magical girls who chose lives like these too, but her officer muttered out, Recently, regulations have become strict. If you even do something unreasonable, you lose your qualifications. Even I have to deal with it alone, while looking off into the distance again. Sakura didn't suddenly become a person, er, didn't suddenly become a successful person by becoming a magical girl. Was Sakura not a protagonist? No, Sakura was a protagonist. To other people besides Sakura, er, besides Sakura was no, the other people besides Sakura were no exception. They were protagonists too. This world was crowded with only protagonists. They believed they were the center of the universe. That their birth was the beginning of the universe, that their death was the end of the universe. Sakura had none of that. Before Sakura was born, the world had existed. And when Sakura dies, the world will still continue. Only Sakura wasn't special. When she realized this, she was shocked. The world was overflowing with protagonists, and most of those protagonists couldn't do what they aimed for, and had to compromise before they reached their goals. If she kept on doing this, then Sakura would have to as well. Just becoming someone in the crowd who people would forget. For the first time in her life, her impatience rose. Anything would be okay. She wanted something. She had a hungry feeling, but she had nothing in her hands. She was like a fish laid on top of a hill. Even if she wanted to breathe, her mouth could only move while no breath could be taken. Should she work hard on her studies? Are there other things too? What should she do? She's finally become a magical girl, but nothing's changed. Her despair only deepened. Sakura became even more low-spirited than before, but one day, one of Sakura's classmates in school tapped on her shoulder. When she turned around, she saw someone from her class, Nami Aoki. She's, she's greeted her, and when she wanted to talk to her about something, she talks to her. That was the kind of relationship they had. She didn't know much about her in detail. She wasn't part of any of Sakura's groups. She was gorgeous, and Sakura was modest. She always succeeded in sports and studying, while Sakura was always in the corner of the classroom. Never one to be the center of rumors in class. Con er, contact with her was close to null. Nami's face was so close by that she could feel her breathing. She unconsciously bent backwards as her shoulders were grasped and her mouth came closer. Kagami, you're a magical girl, aren't you? I saw you transform on the roof of the supermarket. She looked back on her while being grasped, and she returned a refreshing... Refresh, refreshing looking smile. I'm also a magical girl. Sakura Kagami was an ordinary girl. Prism Cherry was also an ordinary magical girl. However, she had some extraordinary encounters. Nami Aoki was someone far from an ordinary girl, and the magical girl she transformed to, Princess Deluge, was a far cry from an ordinary magical girl. So Princess Deluge, I'm assuming, is Neptunia, because Deluge, of course, is water. And she has a tiara, so I guess that goes along with Princess. So, uh, before I get into the next part, let's get some of this. Yo, I'm hyped. Fall is next. My boy. I'm so happy. It's been too long since we see we've seen Fall. I freaking love Fall. Okay. So we have Fall, and I think that's the rest of this read-through. That's until 21, I think. Let's see, what is my time at? Yeah, it's like 18 minutes. I'm probably only going to have time to get to 21 before I need to call it a call it a, uh, call it a video. But, like I said, only like three days until Tuesday, and then you'll get, the, uh, you'll get part two. But either way, let's get into fall. Snow White, it's time for lunch. Wake up, Pwn. The lump rolled up on the futon was silent. It didn't reply to fall's warning. You need to be careful. You don't even look like you'd wake up even if your mother calls you, Pone. There was no reply. He didn't expect to hear any voices replying to him. Fall returned to the magical phone and resumed his work. He had to finish this report by today. While summarizing the documents, Fall thought about Snow White. She hasn't come home yet. Will she be here shortly? 
Or will it take longer? But she'll always come er she'll always come home sometime. Fall knows the strength of Snow White's core. Alright. Um Snow White was a magical girl who was known as the Magical Girl Hunter. That dangerous sounding name was not her officially registered magical girl name. She had a double name in the truest sense. She survived the strongest magical girl, forest musician Clamberry's final test, a test that pitted their candidates to the death, and afterwards she captured countless sympathizers of Clamberry who held their own illegal tests. Flame Flamey, an alumni of Mao's school. Pithy Fred, that's where we had heard Mao Palm before. Like, I knew Mao Palm had been mentioned before, but I didn't know if it was actually in the story or if it was by people that, um, people that I had just talked to about the series. But, uh, yeah, that's where Mao must have been mentioned before when Flame Flamey was taken down. Lame Lamey. Um, Lame Lamey, <laughs> an alumni of, of Mao School. Pithy Frederica, whose other crimes were rumored to be enough to fill a library if you wrote them down. She's captured many magical girls, including famous ones such as them. Before she knew it, she was invited into the examination division and was granted her own investigation rights. She wasn't officially a member, but as an auxiliary auxiliary staff. Her authority was the same as regular workers. The land of magic allowing her to do what she wants despite being an outlaw might hurt their public image, but it was some kind or er, wasn't some kind of late repairing measures. Was there an oddball who liked the way she was doing things as one of the higher ups? Did they just consider her a tool who wouldn't be too bad to use? Did they value her as an honorary land of magic citizen? Fall didn't know any of these. Snow White has caught a total of 27 Magical Girl criminals up until now. There were people who were surprised, thinking that was a lot, and there were also people who scoffed, saying it wasn't enough. In most cases, the criminal would honestly turn herself in, but if the crime was found, some people do resist, and if that happens, Snow White has to pull her own weight to restrain them. The mascot character, Fall, would have to save it as a recording, sharing it everywhere. Of course it wasn't arbitrary, Snow White had told him to. By advertising Snow White's flashy actions, criminals will be deterred and collaborators for detecting, for detecting crimes can be gathered. Of course, she might be shunned by these criminals, and there is a possibility that she'd become a target to them. She was well aware of that. Snow White wanted herself to be a sign, an advertisement, a decoy. Snow White used herself to persevere. So I wonder if Flynn and Lazaline then are allies of Snow White. Knowing that you're sacrificing your own body is equal to making a deal with the devil. Originally known as a mascot character, he has to stop her. However, Fall didn't stop her. Even if Snow White's friend, the magical girl Ripple, talked to her, Snow White's stubbornness wouldn't change. No matter how you tried to stop her, in the end, Snow White will push through it. She won't listen to any persuasion, so all he could do was present her with a safer route of cooperation. He secretly consulted with Ripple and decided, while he'd let her recklessly destroy her own body, he won't let her recklessly push forward. He'll do everything in his ability to protect her. That determination has now lost its meaning. A few months ago, Ripple was caught in an incident, and whether she was dead or alive was unknown. Even when there were hard search activities, her whereabouts seemed to be as if she was never there. She went on this business, tri this business trip to undergo training and was caught in an incident. Why did she volunteer for training? Because she wanted to advance her career. If she was able to progress her career, then she could support Snow White from somewhere well-ventilated, even if it's just a little bit. Snow White knew Ripple's motivations. She looked everywhere for Ripple. She couldn't figure out if she was dead or alive, and since then she hasn't said anything other than to live or said anything other than to live her human life. She hasn't looked for road, rogue magical girls. On the contrary, since she's been called the Magical Girl Hunter, she hasn't even been doing her indispensable routine of helping people. Fall encouraged, calmed, and comforted, but it didn't feel like it reached her heart at all, but he still but still he repeated. Snow White began doing ordinary work that stagnated while she wasn't a magical girl, and while Fall was suffering because he feels helpless, he'll still work to be useful to Snow White. Snow White had lost Ripple. She thought that the responsibility belonged to her. She blamed herself. Ripple only did things because she wanted to. Snow White shouldn't need to blame herself. Ripple acted for Snow White and lost her life. In order to protect those important to her, Snow White had gained power, yet that important thing is now faded out of her palms. By losing Ripple, Snow White herself was also greatly hurt. But this isn't over yet. That's what Fall believed. 
Ripple went through twists and turns for Snow White's activities. She had actively cooperated. Snow White knew what Ripple was thinking. She knew that it couldn't be wasted. Furthermore, there was information the magical girl enveloped in the incident that Ripple... There was information the magical girl enveloped in the incident that Ripple was involved in. Pithy Frederica had escaped. She heard this from the examination division. Just because Ripple was gone doesn't mean rotten magical girls would disappear. She had to punish rogue magical girls. Oh yeah, because Fle's in the examination division, right? Because that's where Nanako-san was? Because the investigation division was Mana and um, Hana's, and then Malpom was from Foreign Affairs. Yeah, so that would have meant Nanako-san was the um, examination division, I think. Or was she Human Resources? She might have been Human Resources, actually. Yeah, I think she might have been Human Resources, so maybe examination's totally different. Maybe that's the one that uh, Pukin was um, formerly a part of. So yeah, maybe things are different. Um, just because Ripple was gone doesn't mean Rotten Magical Girls would disappear. She had to punish Rogue Magical Girls. Snow White will always stand up once again. As a mascot character, he wanted to give her a peaceful life, but he can't deny Snow White's choice of life. He'll accept Ripple's death, throw it off, throw off her futon, and start her life as the. She'll accept Ripple's death, throw off her futon, and start her life as the magical girl hunter once more. The only thing Fall could do now was lay the foundation for that time. When she decides it's time to resume her activities as a magical girl hunter, he'll be prepared. As Snow White's activities are known, her magical girl phone had been receiving leads from anonymous senders. There's some magical girls over here or there doing some bad things like this or that. Usually that's how the messages go. At first, a large number of them were pranks, but Fall still looked at them one by one. Fall's previous master, Keek, had remodeled him. He had a higher performance beyond the abilities of a normal cyber fairy. Using Fall's abilities, nothing's anonymous and he can easily identify the senders. He was able to give out the perfect punishment to the magical girl prankster sending out fake texts, or the ones pulling people's legs by harassing them. Afterwards, he can seriously address the ones that involved real crimes if needed. He'll exercise violence to stop them. As sanctions against the prank texts became known, the tide of pranksters began to decrease. No daredevils tried to make fun of Snow White anymore. If they tried to half-heartedly even come near the magical girl hunter, they'll, ma they'll be made an example of. Fall also didn't just handle the mail, he was able to perform analysis on a selection of information coming from a wide network. Snow White only spoke a few words and doesn't talk much with Fall. As a mascot character, character who served her, he had to think about more things than just what he was ordered to do. Okay. Even when Snow White took a break, Fall continued to work without interruptions. Cyber fairies don't need to rest. Even mages would say that a cyber fairy's biggest merit is that, no matter how much work they're given, they never complain. Really, really like Fall so much. Um, Fall had no intention of complaining either. Since he was voluntarily working in order for Snow White to work safely, it was only natural. He finished making the documents and reporting. He saved the important data. Next, he started up the mail checking software. He noticed that he received one text message and stopped his work. The sender, Ripple. The message was sent from Ripple's magical phone. No one could camouflage their sender's identity before Fall. Among cyber experts of people who watch magical phones, there was a special mascot character, Fall. There was no way for them to trick his eyes. Fall fluttered his wings two and three times inside a virtual space, sprinkling scales. Was Ripple alive? So why hasn't she shown her face? Just what kind of situation was she in? Or was someone just using her magical phone to send a text message? If that was the case, what's their aim? What was the main text of the message? Fall tried to pull together his thoughts, but as he couldn't put anything together, he reopened and checked the text message again. There's a laboratory making man-made magical girls in S-City, K Prefecture. Please investigate. Furthermore, do not harm the others, the others of the contents of this message. If you do not... Uh, okay. Do not inform... Oh, do not inform others of the contents of this message. If you do not follow these instructions, we'll use a magical treatment to erase all of you and your partner's memories. Okay, okay. What was this? Man-made magical girls. Laboratory. Ripple didn't even add the R she'd used to indicate 
or she'd used to indicate her either. It's clear that someone's using Ripple's magical phone to send a text message to Snow White, yet there was no mention of Ripple. Furthermore, is there magic to erase your memories? You can't exactly say there wasn't any treatment that could do that. Keek was also able to enchant text messages after all. When he tried to analyze it for testing, he was blown away. Even with Fall's abilities, he seemed to find it difficult to analyze. In the end, he had no idea why this person was sending the message for. He had no idea, but he had to report it to Snow White. After peeling off the futon, he reported, he reported the mail that was sent. And though it's been a while, they finally began to discuss. Okay, that was a really cool beginning for this. Let me make sure everything's good. Yep. Okay, that was a really cool beginning. I really, really like that. So we got introduced to Prism Cherry, who is really cool. I really like her backstory and general idea of her character. We have Snow White coming back into things, mostly through Fall's eyes right here, showing what happened after she found out about Ripple and how it affected her work for a while, and eventually she had to get back to it. Uh, but it has definitely negatively affected her, but he's trying to get her back into things properly. And now we have this mysterious message. It could be from Pithy, but if Pithy doesn't actually have the phone, it could be one of the other survivors from, um, from Limited. It could potentially be Nanako-san, who we know is working for Fle, even though she might not know that Fle is evil, probably doesn't know. Or it could even be Mana. Um, so it could be something like that. Uh, so we have this mystery going on with them making man-made magical girls. Again, like, like Fall was saying, whatever that means. Um, and beyond that, we also got the story at the beginning, the prologue, that is probably going to be something, since it's a prologue, we're probably not going to see much more about it uh, until maybe like the end or something, because we see that Lazaline is going to take the, uh, the memories that she doesn't need the Land of Magic figuring out away from Fle and give them to somebody, and there's a chance that Fle could be giving those memories to uh, Snow White. There is a chance. And maybe Snow White can use those memories to do something or another that she needs to. Uh, so we'll see how things go there. But um, yeah, that was a really, really good start. Like I said, only like three days and then you'll have part two. And then part three will be, um, part three will be next Tuesday after that. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to split these into three parts a chapter or if I'm going to have to do four parts a chapter. Because like I said, each of them seem to be pretty damn long. Uh, so I'm going to shoot for three parts a chapter, but depending on how long it is and how long my videos end up being, like this one's probably about 50 minutes, maybe a tiny bit less than that, uh, but somewhere around there. Um, so yeah, depending on how long that is, it might probably take four parts a chapter, which would be the same pace generally as limited. Uh, but that's it. Hope you enjoyed. Like, if you did like the video, comment down there too. Tell me what you thought of this, um, what you thought of this first part and everything like that. Uh, and my thoughts on it and all that, my reaction. Um, follow on Twitter if you want, and I'll try to keep you updated on stuff for the channel or talk to you there. Subscribe for more Magical Girl Raising Project, much more on the channel. Uh, and if you want to link to the Discord server to talk to me or more of us on Discord, there's a ton of Magical Girl Raising Project discussion there and discussion of a bunch of other things. Whatever you want to talk about, it's free and open for anyone. So if you want a link, just ask me and I'll give you one. That's it. Thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.